فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters welcome back to our Q&A session Ramadan with Ustad Abd Rahman Hassan the first question is I'm a Quran teacher and in Ramadan the Imam of the Masjid he burdens me to lead Salat al Tarawih before it is officially announced for Ramadan so what is the ruling of praying on the night of doubt of Ramadan Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen والصلاة والسلام على من أرسله الله رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه وإخوانه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد صلاة التراويح is سنة مؤكدة it's an emphasized voluntary prayer for the men and the women in Ramadan and it is from the apparent symbols of Islam the sha'air that are ظاهره, the apparent symbols of Islam. When Ramadan comes in, one of the things that show you that Ramadan's atmosphere, and this is a Ramadani atmosphere, is the entering or the praying of Salatul Tarawih. And Salatul Tarawih is connected to the beginning of the first night of Ramadan. So when tomorrow Ramadan is going to enter, the night before it, is the night which the scholars call it, they call it Lay Awalu Laylati Min Ramadan. The night, first night of Ramadan. That is when the Taraweeh starts. And it starts as a congregation. People pray together. And the best time that a person can pray it is at the, uh, the first part of the night after Salatul Isha. And this is the action of the people at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu as al-Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah narrated that Umar radiyallahu anhu he said ni'ma al-bid'atu hadihi wal-lati yanamuna anha afdalu min al-lati yaqumuna that Umar radiyallahu anhu he said what a good innovation this is and what Umar means by this is that what a good reviving of a dead act. Because this act was, it died out. Because the Prophet ﷺ, as we're going to see, is something he stopped doing. And so Umar anhu revived this again. And we are specifically commanded to follow who? To follow Umar anhu and Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali. And uh, based on the hadith of Irbad ibn Sariyah ta'ala anhu. وَالَّتِي يَنَامُونَ عَنْهَا أَفْضَلُ مِنَ الَّتِي يَقُومُونَ He refers, he's, he's trying to say here, the people who are standing, the first night are better than those who are standing at the later of the night. And that understanding was taken by Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, when this uh, statement of Umar was read to him. They asked him, يُؤَخَّرُ الْقِيَامُ Should the person delay the, the taraweeh? Or should they pray at the first night? Straight after Isha. And he said, La sunnatul muslimin ahabu ilayya. The sunnah of the people are more beloved to me, referring to the action that Umar radiallahu anhu uh, did. And of course, that is also not only is it good, but it's also something that makes matters easy for the people. And Islam is a religion, it has come to make matters easy for the people. And this is also what can unite the people and bring them bring them together it can bring them it can bring them together and as you know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said man qama ramadan imanan wa ihtisaba ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi this prayer tarawih if anybody stands up with two things iman and ihtisab al iman al ihtisab he will be forgiven Meaning he believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he hopes reward from him subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will be forgiven for his past sins that he has done. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she told us, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يصلي من الليل في حجرته وجدار سوري وجدار الحجرة قصيرا. That the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to pray 
and the wall of his room was very short. فرأى الناس شخص النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the people saw the Prophet praying because his wall was very low, so they saw him pray عليه الصلاة والسلام. فقام أناس يصلون بصلاة فأصبح فتحدث بذلك. فقام الليل ليلة ليلة الثانية. فقام معه أناس يصلون بصلاته. صنع ذلك ليلتين أو ثلاثا حتى إن حتى إذا كان بعد ذلك جلس رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلم يخرج فلما أصبح ذكر ذلك الناس فقال إني خشيت أن تكتب عليكم صلاة الليل. That when the prophet the people saw the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم praying they could see him because his wall was very short they came over and they prayed with him and again they prayed with him two or three nights and after that the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he withheld from uh, leading them. And then the Prophet told them in the morning the reason why he did what he did is he said, I feared that the night prayer would be made obligatory on you. So based on these two hadiths, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and um, the action of Umar radiallahu anhu, it shows that the permissibility of praying Salatu at Taraweeh Jama'atan in a congregation. And it's not just that it's done as a congregation, but it also takes place at the time when it's Qiyam Ramadan. And that it takes place the time when it is what? When it is Ramadan. Not before it, nor after it, not on a time when it's doubtful. Because the hadith specifically says, Man qama Ramadana. Iman and Wahtisama. Anyone who stands in Ramadan. The hadith is talking about that the Ramadan has entered. As for this beloved brother of ours who the who's been requested to lead, he shouldn't be soft in accepting that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear that he may fall under the verse of Allah. What do law to dhiru for you You may soften for the people and they may soften for you. So you're trying to uh, soften the rulings of Allah. And that truly would anger him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll fall under the hadith of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which Tirmidhi ibn Hibban, and the wording is ibn Hibban's wording, bin hadith Aisha, and Al-Albani authenticated in Sisila hadith al-Sahihah, man arda allaha bi sakhati al-nasi kafahu allah, wa man asqat allaha bi rida al-nasi, wa kalahu allahu ila al-nasi. Anyone who pleases Allah tabarak wa ta'ala in anger of the people, then Allah will suffice him. And anybody who pleases, sorry, who angers Allah by trying to please the people, Allah wa ta'ala will leave you with the people. And if Allah leaves you with the people, then your affairs is truly not going to be taken care, is not going to be taken care of. So if it's not the night of Ramadan, that our brother should not stand up in prayer, and he should not accept the request of anyone who may request from him to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. The second question is, is it permissible to fast a voluntary fast while there is an outstanding fast upon me? There is no dispute amongst the ulama and the unanimously in agreement that paying back the obligatory fasting is greater and it's better than coming with a voluntary prayer. That's mahalu ijma, that is better. So let me emphasize on this point, which is that there is no dispute amongst the ulama on every spectrum of the argument and the discussion. There is no dispute amongst them that bringing back the wajib fasting is greater and it's better than coming with the voluntary fasting. The reason being that the, of, uh, the, uh, the fasting which is wajib, the fasting which is, which is wajib is higher in station and in rank. And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala it is more beloved to him, the things that are wajib and the fara'id, than the recommended act. Based on the hadith al-Qudusi, where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah said, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ And there is, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ My slave doesn't come close to me. بِشَيْءٍ Any matter. أَحَبَّ More beloved to me, that which I made obligatory on him. That's most beloved to me. The most beloved thing, unrestrictedly. 
So Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He loves and is pleased with the person to come with that which is obligatory before anything else. And as I said, this is a nas and the ijma of the ummah is more aqid, that is better. Also, it, the matter becomes even more serious that if the person fears and he is scared that he will not be able to fast the obligatory fasting because of upcoming series of problems. For him to then pray fast the voluntary at that particular moment, knowing that in the future he won't be anywhere able to fast that which is obligatory. For instance, she's a sister who breastfeeds, for example. And she's got a child coming on her way, she's pregnant, and then after that, a year, she's, two years, she's going to be breastfeeding and etc. And she knows that not any time soon is she going to be what? Bringing back that, the obligatory fasting. For her then to busy herself with a voluntary prayer is also something that is incorrect. And that she shouldn't. Because it goes against the statement of Allah where he says, فَاسْتَبِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَرْجِعُكُمْ جَمِيعًا فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ فِيهِ تَخْتَلِفُونَ Hasten to the good. And the good here, first of all, what comes first is the wajibat. So you, you hasten to that which is wajib before anything else. Allah also says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّةٍ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Also, in the hadith that was transmitted about the virtue of the fasting of Shawwal, the six days of Shawwal, the textual evidence clearly instructs, instructs and clearly says that the rewarding of fasting the six days of Shawwal, the reward is what? It's as though you fast today what? A year. It's after the person when they come with that which is obligatory. Because the Prophet said, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ ثُمَّ أَتْبَعَهُ سِتًّا مِنْ شَوَالٍ كَانَ كَصِيَامِ الدَّهْرِ That anyone who fast Ramadan and then he follows it up with six days of Shawwal, it's as though it's as though he has fasted the whole year. Now here a question arises amongst the ulama, which is that this hadith, does it mean that first of all I have to fast Ramadan and then I follow the six days of Shawwal and then I will get this reward which is كَانَ كَصِيَامِ الدَّهْرِ Some of the ulama said that. That they said you have to fast Ramadan first. Once you've accomplished your Ramadan and you've done your Ramadan, then you, you face six days of Shawwal and then you will get the reward of as though you fasted the whole year. That's one group of scholars. The second group of scholars, they said, no. من صام رمضان ثم أتبعه ستة من شوال كان كصيام الدهر is not saying that you have to do this it just it's speaking from the angle of خرج مخرج الغالب لا مفهوم له which means normally that's what a person would do normally that is what a person will do sometimes in the نصوص you would find evidences which are مخرج الغالب because this is the common thing that people do and this is the norms that generally speaking people fast Ramadan and then they fast Shawwal, right? And that's the overwhelming majority of the people. Um, so the other scholars who said that that it is, you guys are saying that it's kharaja makharaj al ghalib Do you have an evidence to prove that? They said, naam, there is an ihtimal, there's an evidence that strengthens this argument of us which is that أَنَّهُ خَرَجَ مَخْرَجَ الْغَالِبِ is that the hadith of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam where he said مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ فَشَهْرٌ بِعَشْرَةِ أَمْ أَشْهُرٍ وَصِيَامُ سِتٍ أَمْ وَصِيَامُ سِتْ أَيَّامٍ بَعْدَ الْفِطْرِ فَذَلِكَ تَمَامُ الصِّيَامِ السَّنَةِ this hadith specifically the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam says to us in this hadith the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam he says he who fast Ramadan has 10 months as a reward for every month and fasting six days after Eid is a complete year of fasting. So this hadith shows us that the person has six, has what? Has what? 10 months. This hadith is specifically telling us this hadith is specific telling, specifically telling us that the person has 10 months and then the fasting of the six days you have months to come. And also the other hadith that strengthens it is the act of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha what she did. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha 
He said, كان, ي... كان يكون علي الصيام من رمضان فما أستطع أن أقضي إلا في الشعبان. عائشة رضي الله عنها, she said, and this is her action, that there would be a fasting of Ramadan on me and I am unable to fulfill it إلا في الشعبان except in Shaban. Ibn Hajar commented on this hadith and he said, وفي الحديث دلالة على جواز تأخير قضاء رمضان مطلقا سواء كان لعذر أو لغير عذر لأن زيادة كما بينه مدرج فلو لم تكن مرفوعة لكان الجواز مقيدا بالضرورة لأن للحديث حكم الرفع لأن الظاهر لاطلاع اطلاع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم على ذلك مع التوفر الدواعي أزواجه على سؤال منهم عن أمر الشرع فلولا أن ذلك كان جائزا لم تواطب عائشة عليه Ibn Hajar rahimahullah in summary what he says is this hadith is an evidence to show the permissibility of delaying the bringing back of Ramadan unrestrictedly whether it's for an excuse or not for an excuse. And then he also mentions that this ziyada is a mudraja. It's the statement of Aisha herself. It is even that though it doesn't have hukm al-raf'i but it still does have hukm al-raf'i because it falls under the taqreer of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam is that the Prophet ﷺ had consented to this. And this was something Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to do muadaba, meaning she used to consistently do this. And some may ask, why would she always do this? It's because Aisha would do hajj, and it would take them to come back from hajj months. She would do hajj, and it would take her months to come back, to do her, uh, uh, come back to Mecca, uh, sorry, to Medina, where she resides. So this is the ihtimal and her reasoning. So, uh, the goal which is inshallah ta'ala is that it's better that the person brings back the fasting of Ramadan first before they go for shawwal but if they do so there is no problem wallahu alam the third question is what is the correct wording of the takbirah on the day of eid and the three days coming after eid so the question here is is that what is the correct method and the correct way of the doing the takbirah uh, of the day of Eid and the Ayyam al-Tashriq the Ayyam al-Tashriq as we all need to know is that there is no authentic um, hadith which is transmitted from the Prophet والسلام, that has come regarding the method of takbirah but the most authentic thing that has transmitted to us is that which Abdul Razak ibn Hammam al-Sal'ani narrated bi sanadin sahihin an Salman radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that he said كبروا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر كبيرا. so the person what do they say they say الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر كبيرا. البيهقي in his فضائل الأوقات he narrated ابن حجر he brings in فتح الباري and he says أخرجه عبد الرزاق بسند صحيح ابن حجر authenticated. also it's transmitted from ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنه that he used to say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd, Allahu Akbar wa ajallu, Allahu Akbar wa ala ma hadana. Ibn Abbas used to say this, Hafid brings, sorry, Ibn uh, Bayhaqi, sorry, brings it in Sunan al-Kubra, and Al-Bani authenticates it in uh, his Irwa' al-Ghalil. Also, Hafid Ibn Hajar, he says that, وَقَدْ أُحْدِثَ فِي هَذَا الزَّمَانِ زِيَادَةٌ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا أَصْلَ لَهَا at the time of Ibn Hajar, people started to add on extra things that had no foundations and no asal for it. Also, what has been transmitted from Ibn Mas'ud anhu in other forms which are authentic, which is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. So, those are all forms that the person can come with. As for a hadith which is marfu'un ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nothing has come authentically transmitted from the Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam. Naam. The fourth question is, is it permissible to pray the Eid prayer in a school which is near a mosque where men pray in one hall and across the road in another hall the women pray? The asal is that it's permissible um, to follow an imam, to follow the imam, even if there is between you an object, or if there is between you a wall, or if there is between you something, as long as like him, that the person who is following the muqtadi, the one who is following the imam, he either can see the movement of the imam, or he can hear the movement of the imam. Meaning there's a speaker that the imam is, imam is saying, Allahu Akbar, and you can hear it. Or you can actually 
you can actually see it. If there is a wall or something between you, there is no darar, there is no harm. The asal is that it's permissible. And the evidence that strengthens this is the fi'l of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he prayed ala dhahri al-masjid. He prayed on the roof of the masjid uh, with the prayer of the imam. And also the action of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu أنه كان يجمع في دار أبي نافع عن يمين المسجد بصلاة الإمام ويأتم بالإمام مع السكوت الصحابة على فعله Also Anas ibn Malik He used to gather in the house of Abi Nafi Which was on the right side of the masjid But he would pray with the imam And the sahabas would be silent about the act of Anas ibn Malik And no one would say anything about it Shawkani brings it in his Nail al-Awtar Shawkani brings it in his Nail al-Awtar so we have two companions. We have the action of Abu Huraira and we also have the action of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. All these statements that I brought from Anas ibn Malik and Abu Huraira, it's all taken when there is a need and that the person is in a state of requirement. If that's not the case and you're not in need of it or there is not a serious circumstances, then what the person should do is that they should come to the masjid because you're going to leave off the command which has been authentically transmitted from the messenger alayhi salatu salam pertaining to what? bi wasl sufufi connecting of the lines and making sure there is no gaps in the masjid all of those ahadiths would have no importance if the person is praying somewhere else and also filling the masjid because if the masjid is not full then the sahabas would not allow a person to just pray somewhere else so if the masjid is empty and this is very common you see in Haram, for example. You find this common in Masjid in Nabawi. Or you find it in Haram in Nabi, uh, Haram in Makki. You find that the people will pray outside the Masjid, when in reality it's empty inside the Masjid. So the Masjid has to be full first, uh, before anybody starts to think about, starts to think about praying outside the Masjid. Also, Hisham, and his father, his father Urwah ibn Zubayr, they also used to pray in the house next to the masjid whilst the what? The masjid was full. The masjid was completely full and Urwah and his son Hisham, they used to pray in a house near a mosque which was full of people. They followed the imam. They would make sure that the imam, they followed him knowing that the house and the mosque were separated with a way. A, a path came and it actually had blocked off the, uh, the, it blocked off the uh, masjid. So there, is a, there was a road between the two of them. So this is something that you could, Musannaf ibn Abdul Razak, he brings it in his Musannaf. Um, he says, جِئْتُ أَنَا وَأَبِي مَرَّةً فَوَجَدْنَا الْمَسْجِدَ قَدِمْ تَلَأَ Hisham says, I, I and my father, Min Urwah ibn Zubayr, we both came to the masjid, we found it full. فَصَلَّيْنَا بِالصَّلَاةِ الْإِمَامِ فِي دَارِ We prayed the prayer of the imam in a house in the masjid, next to the masjid. بَيْنَهُمَا طَرِيقٌ There was a path and there was a road in between them. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, رحمه الله, in his Majmu' al-Fatawa, the 23rd volume, page 410, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, يفصل في المسألة, he goes into speaking about it in more details, عليه رحمة الله. So what I say to this uh, is that you can pray, and as long as the message is not full and knowledge is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now inshallah ta'ala we will conclude there bi-idhnillah al-kareem for the questions uh, anything that I have said that was incorrect or wrong is from me as shaitan and Allah and his messenger are free from it subhanakallah wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illallah astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh